I'd like to welcome you to this presentation. My name is Edward Jackson. I am the Community Engagement Programs Manager for the Center for AIDS Research at the University of Alabama at Birmingham in the United States. What I do at UAB, I engage and educate the marginalized and impoverished, including the faith-based communities about research, its purpose and impact. I provide leadership and training on building these relationships. We build robust, trustworthy, and meaningful relationships to reduce health disparities in HIV in the Deep South. We offer services to researchers and community partners who are conducting or who are interested in conducting behavior and community science studies in the area of HIV prevention and treatment. In short, I bring academic to the community to improve individuals' quality of life and build bridges. I am pleased to present to you today the Reverend Kim Jackson and Justin Smith. Thanks, Eddie. It's so good to be here. I am the Reverend Kim Jackson. I'm an ordained Episcopal slash Anglican priest serving a congregation in Atlanta, Georgia, and the United States. I serve the Church of Common Ground, which is a church without walls. And I'll say a bit more about that later, um, but it's important to know that my congregation, um, our members live on the streets of Atlanta, and they do not have often houses to go to at night. Greetings, my name is Justin Smith, and I serve as the director of the Campaign to End AIDS at Positive Impact Health Centers, which is a comprehensive HIV AIDS uh, service organization based here in Atlanta. I also am a behavioral scientist within the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University, and I also have the pleasure of serving as the co-chair of the Stigma and Disparities Subcommittee of the American uh, Presidential Advisory Council on HIV and AIDS. Thank you, Reverend Jackson and Mr. Smith. This short presentation has two objectives. First, we want to highlight the importance of ensuring those most affected by HIV in their communities or at the table in places of leadership when HIV programs are developed and implemented. We also want to speak to some distinctive challenges that faith-based programs in the United States face in this regard. Secondly, we want to highlight the ways in which this commitment to listen to local community priorities is informing faith-based COVID responses in the United States. To meet these objectives, we're going to briefly describe a research initiative carry out our colleagues at Emory University in Atlanta. Connect that specific initiative to the broader collaboration between faith communities and HIV researchers through the Center for AIDS Research. And close by pointing to two faith-based COVID responses that reflect such commitments. We'll start by hearing about the initiative at Emory. I turn the presentation over now to Kim and Justin. Thanks, Eddie. I'm glad to be able to tell you about this project called Sacred Truths, Atlanta's Black Queer Voices. Justin and I served as facilitators for this workshop as, that was held as a part of this initiative. We're gonna tell you about the preliminary findings from those workshops in just a moment, but first a little background on Sacred Truths. The initiative is looking to hear from black gay men in Atlanta about their experiences with religion and to gain insights from them on the best ways to develop faith-based HIV initiatives that include them and their perspectives. Such perspectives are essential for faith-based HIV programs in Atlanta to be effective in the community most affected by HIV in Atlanta, the community of Black gay men. This is a community with the HIV prevalence within the city of Atlanta of over 40% and a community too seldom reached by HIV awareness and testing campaigns. Almost one in five black gay men living with HIV in Atlanta meet the criteria for an AIDS case definition within three months of their initial diagnosis. This shows that many are finding out about their HIV status long before, long after becoming infected. The Sacred Truths Initiative 
was originally designed to be carried out through a series of interactive day-long workshops. But when COVID hit, we worked hard to retool the structure and move them online. To date, we've held online workshops with a total of 17 Black gay men. You can see the demographics of participants on this slide. The average age is 48, and 13 of the 17 men are living with HIV. In general, the participants indicated that religion was important as they were growing up, both within their immediate family and in their own lives. As adults, the religious practices of these men is varied. Six in 10 do not frequently attend worship, but 40% of the participants regularly worship in a local faith community. Very few, only 6%, are regularly involved in any religious events outside of worship. We began the workshops by asking participants to tell us about the predominant messages they heard about homosexuality and about HIV in their faith communities growing up. Every participant described explicit messages of judgment and condemnation about homosexuality, and most heard similar judgmental messages about HIV being a divine punishment for homosexuality. Such messages stand in sharp contrast to the most important religious or spiritual belief about sexuality and HIV that these men affirm in their adult lives. These messages were overwhelmingly affirmative, although some participants spoke to the continued power of those older messages in their lives today. The quote from one participant on the slide summarizes the, these affirmative messages well. Our sexuality as gay men is a part of us just like any of our other identities. All of those identities that make us who we are, or who, yeah, who we are reflect God's divine image. We also asked the men to tell us about the role of the black church, that the black church has had in Atlanta's black communities. They told us about the important role of the Black church as a community anchor and institution and its historical role in the Black civil rights movement in the United States. The role of the Black church in Atlanta's Black queer communities was not nearly so positive. Participants saw the church as an engine of discrimination and violence, even as they referenced a small but growing number of faith communities that affirmed the lives of queer people. This complex and often ambivalent effect of religion in their lives was evident. Participants spoke of the struggle to reconcile the two and described the emotional toll of sitting in this contradiction. A few participants described the refusal of younger black gay men to live with the status quo. And they described how black gay men are leaving traditional churches behind to establish their own faith communities when the historic black church traditions are not welcoming. Our project is ongoing. As we summarize these findings, we'll follow up with in-depth interviews with a small number of black gay men to explore these topics more deeply. With religious leaders in Atlanta working on HIV prevention to discuss the implication of these findings on faith-based HIV programs, and with HIV service providers to gather input on what kinds of faith-based partnerships could support Atlanta's HIV prevention, treatment, and support efforts. A few things are clear from the preliminary findings, however. First, faith-based HIV programs that re-stigmatize gay men will obviously fail in Atlanta's Black gay men's communities. Second, programs that ignore the reality of Black gay men's lives by refusing to broach the subject will have little impact. Finally, programs that affirm Black gay lives, but that don't include Black gay men themselves, will be seen with some suspicion. Only 12% of the participants indicated that they trusted religious leaders or their messages. The only faith-based model that will be effective for this community will be one in which Black gay men themselves and the Black gay religious leaders who reflect the community are involved in developing and implementing the programs. Thank you, Justin and Kim, for describing this project and for your leadership in it. 
The Emory Project is one example of a number of collaborations being carried out between HIV researchers and local faith communities in the U.S. The National Institutional Health Fund's Center for AIDS Research at 17 research universities around the nation. Emory is home to one of these CIFARs. Beginning in 2016, the CIFAR launched the Faith and Spirituality Research Collaborative as a way to share both successes and challenges across these collaborative efforts. Our second research conference was scheduled for May of this year when COVID hit, forcing us to move our conference from an in-person to an online format. Over the summer of 2020, the collective hosts these separate webinars, three separate webinars. We examined the ethical obligation to involve local communities in leadership when conducting HIV research, describe models in which faith communities were working with CIFAR researchers, especially religious leaders and faith communities representing Black communities that showed a disappropriate HIV disease burden in the United States and identify some lessons and capacities coming out of the HIV response that could inform the response to COVID-19. The webinars highlighted the need for a COVID response to contextually relevant and to champion by the communities most effective. They demonstrated that the service capacity and established partnerships built over a number of years in the HIV response are crucial for, communi for communicating messages and services in the COVID response. The webinars frame the epidemiological data showing a disappropriate disease burden of both HIV and COVID in the black and brown communities in the United States as evidence of social, structural, cultural, and political inequalities. Public health and medical researchers in the United States are struggling right now to respond to these inequalities. One thing is clear in the light of the massive Black Lives Matter movement, they have been part of virtually all communities in the United States this summer. There must be coordinated, sustained, committed efforts to figure out what a society level response to such systematic inequality looks like. In the meantime, there's a critical time-sensitive need to attend to those who are most vulnerable to infection, illness, and death, especially as efforts to prevent the spread of COVID-19 carry a concurrent social, economic, and emotional toll. Keenly aware of such needs, we wanted to highlight two programs that offer an example of such response. I'm going to turn this back over now to Kim because she is directly involved in one of these programs. Thanks, Eddie. I'm so glad to be able to tell you briefly about my parish where I pastor and what we're up to. The Church of the Common Ground has been around for more than 10 years, long before COVID existed. But when the infection um, hit our shores in the US and then ultimately in Atlanta, we gathered all of the resources that we've been providing to people who experience homelessness. Uh, we partnered with other communities, often faith-based organizations like Central Outreach, which is a Presbyterian organization, uh, to make sure that people had access to whatever housing was available. And we also partnered with Mercy Care, a Roman Catholic organization that provides health care. Whenever we would gather for worship services to have food to share a meal during COVID-19, Mercy Care would often come and do COVID-19 testing for our community. We work with people who are experiencing homelessness because they need spiritual care, just like the rest of us. And I'm grateful to be a part of an organization and a community that provides that for those who are homeless. The Church of the Common Ground where I work is an example of a faith response that happens outside of the traditional walls of a traditional church. I wanna highlight another faith response to COVID that originated in the United States and that's actually happening online. In March of 2020, Rabbi Joshua Lesser, a rabbi here in Atlanta, who is also a longtime HIV advocate an out gay man and happens to be a dear friend, 
organized a Facebook, a Facebook group for clergy from various religious traditions to share resources and to seek to offer support to one another in the midst of the COVID response. Today, this group has over 7,400 members with religious leaders from a variety of traditions around the world. And it provides a central virtual hub for sharing pastoral, public health, prevention, and online worship resources in response to COVID. Thank you, Eddie, and thanks for Kim for that note. Uh, and also for describing the work of the Faith Collaborative of the CFARS, and for Kim, for you highlighting and lifting up these two examples of faith-based responses to COVID here in the United States. Uh, we want to thank you all for giving us this opportunity to talk about these topics, and we look forward to the question and answer to discussion to follow. Thank you.